Hello, and welcome to Myths, Mysteries, and More, Episode 2. This time, we're going to be talking about the Bacchiae by Euripides. So let's just uh, put this out there. The, the Bacchiae is perhaps one of the greatest plays that has ever been written uh, in any culture, at any time, ever. I know that's pretty high praise, but there's a reason why it survived this long, and why it's still performed. It's because it's that good. Um, Euripides himself, obviously, is considered one of the greatest playwrights to have ever lived. Um, he's considered one of the three great playwrights, along with Aeschylus and Sophocles, um, that come out of ancient Greece. And before we really get into the Bacchiae itself, we need to talk about Euripides, because like most playwrights of the ancient era, and honestly, like most writers in general, a lot of Euripides' personal beliefs blend into his work. But what makes it specifically important when it comes to Euripides is that he was pioneering techniques that will later be considered standard. In some ways, despite being the last of the three great playwrights to come out of ancient Greece... He's also the one that makes the the biggest strides in terms of, like, writing in what we would probably call the modern style. I don't mean that he's writing in a modern style. What I mean is that he comes the closest to emulating things that we would consider familiar today. Um, a lot of future playwrights, including Shakespeare, obviously... Um, take a huge amount of inspiration from Euripides, uh, mostly for all of his various innovations. Uh, we'll get to those, but before we do that, we need to talk about Euripides himself. So who's Euripides and what's his deal? Well, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, depending on who you are, because he's such a famous figure, because he wrote such famous plays... He's kind of turned into a mythological figure. In fact, he ends up in a bunch of mythological stories from later periods. So how much is real about him and how much is uh, fake, we don't know. But what we do know, ostensibly, is that he was born somewhere around 480 BCE. I'm not really sure on the exact date. Uh, he was born around Salamis, uh, which we know for a fact. And supposedly he lived somewhere near Athens. This count. If this all sounds very uh, inexact, that's not on accident because we again a lot of this is speculation that we've put together from various things. Anyway, uh, we do know from a very young age he was going to be a playwright. Originally, he wanted to be an actor. Uh, it's worth noting though that actors were not considered. Uh, very highly in ancient Greece. Despite all the playwrights, being an actor was not a prestigious thing. Um, in fact, most people considered actors to be the lowest of the low uh, in nearly every regard. So, at some point, he changed from being a actor to being a playwright. Uh, he began writing... Uh, mostly for other people before he began writing for himself. Uh, and then he died. If that doesn't sound like a very detailed life, uh, again, because we don't have a whole lot about him, we actually know more about his, like, what happens after he dies than we do about him himself. Because after he dies, people who were his students or admirers begin to practically deify him. And like, a cult of religion or a cult of personality develop around him as a figure. Authors begin putting him in their works, and he transitions from a fairly, like, normal guy who lived in ancient Greece into a quasi-mythological figure. And we know way more about that because it was all in their writings. So, having said all that, what is his deal? What is his, what is his big thing? Euripides is 
primarily focused on personal stories. One of the things that marks him out as a comparison to other playwrights is that for Euripides, the gods are not like distant figures who can't be understood. For Euripides, gods have personalities, they have personal traits, they are directly involved in things, um, they are directly involved in the day-to-day -day lives of everyone else, um, they have moral failings, they have successes. He writes the gods as though he was writing any other character, and that is a distinct trait of his that would become more normalized after his death, but wasn't particularly normal before this point. It's important to notice that this is a departure from earlier playwrights and also earlier stories, I guess you could say. If you compare it to something like the Iliad or the Odyssey, where gods are very distant, where divine figures are more forces of nature than they are characters or individuals, this is a huge departure. Um, but a lot of this is because Euripides is trying to use his plays as a way to introduce the public to new ideas. Obviously, in ancient Greece, there was not a huge separation between philosophers and playwrights. Some did one or the other, but lots of them dabbled in both. Um, the skills required for them were basically the same, as long as you, you know, possessed a creative mind, I guess. But the fact that your job was essentially be smart enough to read and write and be capable of thinking of new ideas, you know, playwrights and philosophers dabbled a whole lot. It's also worth noting that Euripides really, really liked to incorporate real-life concepts into his work. So what does that really mean? Well, we can kind of look at what's going on around him when he's writing. So, for example, during his lifetime, the Peloponnesian War breaks out. Uh, for those unaware, the Peloponnesian War is this huge conflict between Athens and Sparta over the future of ancient Greece. Essentially, it's a conflict that Sparta eventually wins and then essentially loses all of its gains within a generation. It is a war which at the time consumed every part of Greece, and yet it accomplished not much at all in hindsight. So with that as a backdrop, Euripides, you know, obviously is, is an Athenian. He cheerleads for his own side. He writes various plays about, you know people's duty to their city-states, uh, about the glories of war, things like that. Uh, he writes in a kind of... How do I put this? He writes as like a kind of... like, great tragedy in the sense of like, it's a tragedy to die in war, but it's also extremely honorable. I don't know how exactly to put that. Um... And then the war ends, and he, obviously Athens loses, and he begins to write a whole lot of really depressing pieces about how pointless everything is, and he sort of falls into what we would today call depression, uh, and he just writes a whole lot of things that involve, like, the pointlessness of existence, essentially. After that period, uh, after he breaks out of his depression, he falls into what we would today almost refer to a Dada-esque uh, way of writing, where he writes various plays that don't really, like, go anywhere. They're just kind of, they just kind of exist. They exist to exist, and he's getting away from all of his old ways of writing. And then, in his later years before his death, he writes most of his greatest works... Uh, he writes Orestes, he writes the Bacchae, um, 
and then he dies. And the best way to describe these plays is that he basically falls back into depression and horrible despair. Uh, and I don't know how else to put that. And it's kind of worth noting that Euripides was at his best when he was young and when he was old. Because everything during the war is not particularly remembered the same way as those two periods of his life. Um, but you can also also see that he's putting a lot of himself into everything. Everything he does, he's putting a part of himself into it. He's talking about things that people can relate to. He's not talking about, like, high-minded idealism as much as he is talking about philosophical concepts and ideas that relate to everyday individual lives. So, for example, in his... In the Medea, he talks a lot about concepts people can understand, about love, about, you know, youthful indiscretion, about love lost, about men cheating on you, about what kind of, you know, how far you'll go to take revenge. You know, then he talks about war a whole lot, uh, which was something everybody could understand because nearly everybody was involved in it. Once that is all over, he leaves uh, all that talk behind, and he begins a period of writing about escapism and nonsense. I think it's worth noting that in nearly every war in history, after the war is over, societies go into this kind of period of... I don't want to say, like, escapism, but essentially, once the wars are over almost every society devolves into this kind of hedonism. Happened to, you can see it every time in the United States, where, like, you know, the 90s are a good example, but also the 80s after uh, the Vietnam War was over, how society kind of transitioned into this sort of extreme hedonism. Uh, and this happens out, you know, this also happened in the 1950s after World War II. Um, it happened in the 1920s after World War I. This is something that was true even in ancient Greece. So having said all that, let's refer to one other thing that's really important to understand about uh, Euripides, which is that it's not just that he's talking about things that matter, he's talking about people that matter. He's talking about the present, uh, which is something that a lot of playwrights avoided. As you can probably imagine, uh, when your job is subsidized by the state, it's usually not a great idea to talk critically or offhandedly about things that the state cares about. This is one thing that every authoritarian state in history understands, uh, and really just every state in general. If your job relies on a patron, it is generally a bad idea to do anything that will paint the patron in a negative light because the patron will get offended. Uh, Euripides, on the other hand, uh, doesn't entirely care, but he also is careful enough that he never uh, gets murdered for it, let's put it that way. Which did happen in ancient Greece if you were impious in the wrong ways and people disliked the ideas you were putting out there. The state could just kill you. Um, so we don't really want that. But all the same, Euripides is very interested in talking about the present day. He is interested in talking about... Uh, I don't want to say he's interested in talking about authoritarianism, but he is. And I guess there's no way to avoid this. So... Today, in modern times, we have, a we have a very good understanding of authoritarianism. We have a very good understanding of, like, dictatorships and, you know, the history of monarchies and things like that. Euripides was an Athenian 
he writes in Athens, his job re- relies on Athenian patronage. Uh, all the same, though, Euripides is kind of disillusioned with democracy, and he begins to think of democracy as a failing and as something which is not as good as authoritarianism. This is probably not hugely surprising given the fact that Athens lost the Peloponnesian War, but it's also the fact that during the Peloponnesian War, various demagogues took power in Athens, um, and so Euripides kind of takes a shine to this concept of, like, monarchs being superior to the masses. Now, this isn't as bad as, like, Plato, where Plato basically we might refer to today as a proto-fascist. Uh, it's not nearly that bad. But Euripides essentially becomes extremely disillusioned uh, with the concept of democracy and uh, republicanism, and essentially be- begins to believe that societies are defined by great people, and those great people are the ones to take society in whatever direction uh, they choose to take it in. This gels very nicely with his viewpoints around the gods in his work, because, again, he does not view religion as a rational thing. He does not view it the way, say, Hesiod views religion. So, in the last episode, I talked about Hesiod and his theogony, and about how Hesiod is super interested in explaining things by turning to religion. He's interested in saying, the reason why storms happen is because gods exist, and this is where all the gods have come from, and this is what all their names are. Uh, Euripides is the opposite. Euripides believes that you cannot explain religion that the gods exist, and you cannot define them, essentially. They do things because they are gods. Um, And any rational or philosophical gleam that you give them will innately be not enough. It will be insufficient to actually get the full idea of what they are. And again, this all mixes together with his sudden love of authoritarianism and uh, monarchy. (laughs) It basically boils down to uh, great God, like if great men are the ones who define history, then the gods must be the greatest of great men. And so when he writes things like the Bacchae, he is demonstrating the gods in this kind of role as heroic figures. They are, like, they are individuals who are superior to everyone else, and they are in this position because of their great abilities. In some ways, this is almost entirely opposite the way we as modern people tend to view the gods. Uh, One of the biggest modern viewpoints of gods is that they are listless, uh, almost freeloading figures who sit around in the heavens and do essentially nothing. That's one of the biggest like depictions of gods in mythology in modernity. You see this in DC and in Marvel, for example, how most of the gods are entirely separate from day-to-day life. They live in the heavens entirely removed from humanity. Uh, they don't do very much. This is entirely opposite to the way Euripides views the gods. Euripides views the gods as direct, as they lead the world. They are the greatest figures. They inspire uh, great kings. They are the reason why people succeed or fail. And all of this is extremely important when we talk about the Bacchae, because Dionysus is a direct figure, and his conflict with Penthes is in many ways, a good distillation of his viewpoint of you can't go to war with the gods because the gods are the reason you will succeed or you will fail. So, now that we've talked a whole lot about Euripides, 
Is there more that we need to talk about? The answer is yes, unfortunately. Or fortunately, depending on whether or not you think Euripides himself is all that interesting. The reality is, is that the Bacchiae requires a good understanding of Euripides himself in a way that his earlier plays do not, because he puts a lot of himself in these plays, especially the Bacchiae. It is his masterpiece, it is his masterwork, and so when he's describing things and talking about things and writing about things, it's important to understand that it's coming from a life lived and it's coming from personal experience. So, for example, I talked already about Euripides' view about the great figure ideal that he espouses. Um, he goes a little bit further in a couple of his other works where he talks about essentially that a, a person's worth is not defined by their birth, it is not defined by their physical experiences, it is defined by their mental acuity. Obviously, in a slave-owning caste system, this is kind of revolutionary, but also dangerous, uh, which is why he puts it in his place, as opposed to as a philosopher. Beyond that, uh, Euripides likes to do what we today do all the time, which is he takes mythological figures, again, these were mythology even during his day, and puts them in contemporary situations. So, for example, in the Bacchiae, we're talking about a king of Thebes, we're talking about the god Dionysus, he's depicting all of this in ways that would be familiar to all of his listeners and viewers. Uh, these are things that people of the day would understand as opposed to depicting the distant past. So, essentially, instead of depict like, if you want to compare it to something modern, um, basically Thor in Marvel is a good way of depicting his style, where you take something from, like, thousands of years ago and you put it in modern day and use it as a way to talk about modern day issues. That's Euripides' style. That's how he likes to do things. Unfortunately... This comes with all the problems that we would be familiar with today. When you turn your characters into mouthpieces for ideas about making arguments, or you take characters and their entire point is to become a straw man for certain things, um, they stop being characters with personalities and they start to become just walking, talking uh, blobs of rhetoric. They're not particularly like compelling as characters. Uh, which is why some of his middle works during the Peloponnesian War are less interesting, because the characters stop being characters, and they basically turn into mouthpieces for whatever Euripides wants to talk about. The Bacchiae is perhaps the best example, though, of him being able to meld his two urges together and create something that works as itself. It is a great play, even though it also functions as a mouthpiece for a lot of his ideas, uh, and it works as a play even though it is essentially the culmination of a life led believing that great men are de are essentially made great by the gods. The last thing we should probably talk about, though, is that Euripides fancies himself a psychologist. I don't mean that he would have recognize the concept of psychology, but one thing that becomes very prominent in a lot of his plays is why do people do what they do? Why do, why does people, you know, in the earlier plays, the Medea is a good example. People will do things and her revenge is very clear and why she wants revenge is clear. What is less clear is what everyone else is doing and why. One thing that becomes more prominent as his plays go on, as he wants to make, talk about more about, you know, what he thinks, is a preoccupation with why do people do bad things? Why do people get sucked up in passions? Why do people 
go to war, why do people fight, things like that. These are, in some ways, him working out his own issues, but it's also him trying to work out human nature. One of the things that makes the Bakiai such a great play is that it's focused almost entirely on the darker passions of humanity, the concepts of wildness overriding logical sense. Um, it is focused on it is focused entirely on emotions, is I guess the best way to put it. It is focused on the fact that you cannot, no matter how hard you try, stop emotions. That while emotions are the wilder, more chaotic side of human nature, ultimately they are also the stronger side of human nature when they do come. So in some ways you can understand the Bacchiai as Euripides talking about how logic and reason and the views that surround tradition and morality and society are ultimately just a facade. They are a cage that you put on, or around, I should say, the darker emotions of human nature, but that cage will never be sufficient to actually cage those passions if they decide to get out. So on one hand, you have uh, Penthus as the king of Thebes, acting in a very rational, in a very uh, willful manner, trying to physically impose order upon chaos, whereas Dionysus is chaos itself, and he's a god, and he can do whatever he wants, and no amount of power or will from Penthus can ever actually cage the passions that Dionysus unleashes. We'll get into that when we talk more about the play itself and what happens during it. But it's important to understand that Euripides is having a conversation uh, with the people viewing his play. He's having a conversation with you, the audience. Now, some of the things I've said so far might be, to some people, contradictory. Because on one hand, I'm like, yeah, he's a philosopher and he wants to be a psychologist and he wants to talk about like human nature. And on the other hand, I'm talking about how his viewpoint is essentially that the gods cannot be understood, they decide who is great, and great people decide everything, and there's no logic to anything at all, that you can't cage human nature or passions. These seem like contradictory ideas. Uh, and everything about Eurybides is contradictory in that regard. Part of it might be that we don't have all of his plays, but part of it just might be that Euripides undergoes a number of different transformations over the course of his lifetime in terms of his writing. So, like, for example, some people will mark him out as this uh, pre-Enlightenment Enlightenment figure who would have fit together with people in, like, the 1700s. And other people are like, he's an irrationalist. Like, he's crazy. He is a religious skeptic who doesn't believe in gods. And on the other hand, people are like, well, actually, he believes in literal gods. Uh... And he believes entirely on the concept of divine providence and that gods will do whatever it is they want to do and you're just going to have to deal with it. You know, you have people who on one hand will look at things like the Medea and go, it is an incredibly sexist play. Um, it is extremely regressive. And then you have other people who look at the Medea and go, actually, it's a feminist play about how a woman takes power for herself and murders her children because her husband cheats on her. He is a contradiction in ways that few writers are, and it, it baffles some people. The way I view it is that he's not necessarily a contradiction as much as he is a human being who we can understand through his works. So, if you try to view, like, say, the Medea and the Bacchiai side by side as contemporary works, like, during the same period of time, they're going to look like opposites. But if you understand them as the Medea was written when he was young, the Bacchiai was written when he was old, 
after he's seen war, after he's lost his, like, nostalgia and his idealism, you'll understand that through his works we can see a man's philosophy and way of living change. One of the things about history that can be very hard and challenging is we like to look at people as though they were static, as though they were never changing throughout their entire lives. And Euripides is the kind of writer, the kind of playwright, whose writing changed entirely through his writing, like through his lifetime, where his early works and his later works are completely different. So when we look at the Bacchiae, we have to look at it as this is a guy who is now deeply cynical, and yet, despite his cynicism, is extremely zealous towards his belief in religion and the power of the gods and the... I guess you want to say the power of individuals in terms of shaping the world. I guess that's how the best way I can put it. Okay, we've talked enough about Euripides himself. So now we can actually talk about the Bacchiae, his masterwork. So what is the Bacchiae ostensibly about? First and foremost, it is ostensibly about a conflict between Dionysus, god of wine and madness, and a bunch of other things, and Penthes, his cousin. It is about the fall of a royal house. It is about uh, adultery. It is about uh, man versus God. It is about human nature. It is about so many things. Uh, and it's hard to constantly pin one down because it's an extremely complex work. And I'm not even going to pretend like I'm going to be able to get to everything about the work in this podcast. Like, in this episode, I am not going to be able to talk about everything I want to talk about because we will be here for, like, 20 hours. Um, so let's try to, like, boil it down to, like, the basics. The main focus is on youth, primarily. This is Euripides as an old man writing about young people, young gods, young kings, young women, uh, and about indiscretion, it's about human passion, it's about trying to contain human passion and how foolish this is. So, our primary characters, first and foremost, are, again, Dionysus, who is a young god um, who has been born and come into the world, and he is primarily interested in himself, I guess you could say. He is interested in his cult, his followers, and he is angry at Penthes, his cousin, for banning all of these things. Cutting to Penthes, Penthes is the young king of Thebes. He is extremely rational in the sense that he doesn't believe that his cousin is a god. He doesn't particularly like the rites uh, that the followers of this god perform. He thinks that they are lewd. He thinks that they are um, intemperate. He thinks that they go against all manner of morality. He thinks that they are essentially a threat to society and his rule. Uh, if you want to do like a modern contextualization, um, I think a good one might be like the like the gay rights movement essentially might be a good one. Uh, hippies are another one where you have this this group of individuals who all believe a certain thing and they are becoming prominent and this threatens the morals and sensibilities of the establishment. The establishment is very unhappy about this and wishes to do away with them, but they are ultimately vanquished by this rising tide, essentially. So, our play basically starts out very simply, where essentially we get the story of Dionysus from Dionysus. He is telling us his life story. He is telling us about how he was born, how his mother was tricked by Hera uh, into making Zeus reveal himself to her, how she was incinerated, how he was then... Uh, I guess, just stated inside of Zeus's dick, and then came out, he is, on one hand, 
uh, the son of a mortal woman, but yet he is a full god because he was incinerated. Um, it is worth noting that despite the fact that Dionysus himself, the character, is telling the audience this, it is made clear that people don't actually believe this, that Dionysus is annoyed and angry that mortals refuse to believe that he is a god, essentially. In fact, and this is this will come up later, um, one of the people, or a group of the people who are singled out are his own family members. Uh, specifically, his aunts, who are, again, the sisters of his mother, who basically decide that, actually, Samil wasn't pregnant with a god, she was just a whore, and then she died. And so, they basically just start saying that she's a whore, and that pisses Dionysus off, because you don't tell... A, the, the, you don't tell a god who turns his own mother into a goddess that she's a whore without pissing him off. You just don't do it. Now, at the same time as they are spreading the rumor that actually Samil is a whore and not the mother of Dionysus, Penthus, his cousin, has decided that actually he needs to imprison all of the all of these worshippers. All of these these women who follow Dionysus need to be like locked in a cage and kept away from the rest of society because they are dangerous. They are horribly dangerous and they cannot be allowed to run on their own. So Dionysus pissed off that A, he's Penthus has locked up all of his worshippers, and B, that everybody is saying that his mother was a whore decides that it's time for harsh measures. It is time to assert himself upon the world. It is time to prove to everybody that he was born a god and that you don't piss in his Cheerios, essentially. So Dionysus turns all of the women in Thebes into insane mad women and then drives them out of the city into the mountains to essentially go have an orgy and hang out and smoke weed, essentially. <laughs> Like, he takes all of the women in Thebes, and he's like, all right, women, off to the mountains, we're all going to have great sex, and we're all going to smoke lots of weed and drink wine, and basically just chill, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. This is where our play begins. Dionysus, having done all this, pieces out to the mountains to go chill with all these women, and now we cut to Thebes, where all of the men are essentially panicking because all of their women folk have wandered off to the wilderness to have great sex without them, and they can't go with them because they'll die. Uh, essentially, what ends up happening is more characters are introduced. Uh, a man named Tiresias, who is a blind, elderly old man who can see the future and divine the intentions of the gods because... Even in ancient Greece, there are tropes, and one of the, you know, one of the biggest tropes is the blind old man who can, who can understand the wisdom of the gods. This might be a reference to Homer and how Homer was supposedly a blind poet, but I'm pretty sure that's also just another trope that they put into that story. Anyway, Tiresias is like, yo, Dionysus is, is really angry, but he's having a, a great party. I should go and, and, and go join it. Uh, he looks around for his best friend, Cadmus. Now, Cadmus is Dionysus' grandfather. He's also the founder of Thebes. He's the former king, but now he's old and ancient. And when Tiresias goes, hey, let's go have a party with Dionysus, Cadmus is like, sounds great. And they're like, let's go. But before they can actually go... Penthus shows up. Penthus, again, is Dionysus' cousin. He is another grandson of Cadmus. He's the current king of Thebes, and he's super pissed off that his grandfather and his weird old blind friend are planning to go join in the revelry that Dionysus is currently having. Because, again, Penthus is the establishment. He is super conservative. He really dislikes the fact that anyone would want to go and join the cult of this false god who basically drinks all day and spends his time having sex. Uh, Penthus takes it one step further, speaking of, because 
Penthis is such a buzzkill that he tells all of his soldiers that they should arrest anyone who engages in any kind of Dionysian worship. Okay? Uh, anyone who is acting like the followers of Dionysus should be imprisoned as it is now illegal. It's not just illegal to be a follower, it is illegal to be curious about being a follower. And anyone who even pretends to act barely interested needs to be locked away in a prison forever because Penthes is just having none of this. Um, but the main source of Penthes' ire is a stranger who has come from the east. He Nobody knows who this stranger is, but he's shown up and he introduced all these worship, all this Dionysian worship, all of these strange rites. And Penthes is super pissed off about this, and he's like, we need to find this man, we need to arrest this man, we need to have him like beaten to death, he needs to be stoned, he needs to be like drawn and quartered. No punishment is harsh enough for this man who has introduced all of these rites that are super evil into our into our fair city, which was perfect before he came along. You might notice this is a bit like Footloose. Footloose takes a whole lot of inspiration from the Bacchiae, as do many stories. Anyway, it doesn't take very long for the guards to find this mysterious stranger. The guards apparently didn't have to look very hard, which makes it wonder why on earth it took so long to, to stop him. But the reason is revealed very, very quickly. The reason is, is because the stranger is Dionysus himself. And so Penthus is like, okay, put this man in chains and put him before me. And I'm going to, I'm going to debate with this man. He, he turns into the uh, change my mind meme. He is like, Dionysus is not a god, change my mind. So the two guys have a debate. Uh, and Penthus continues to challenge Dionysus on various things. Dionysus continues to refute him and basically make a fool of him. Uh, and Penthus, after a while of trying to get a straight answer out of Dionysus, who he doesn't know is Dionysus, just kind of loses his shit and is like, you know what, screw you, I'm going to have you killed, lock this man away. In fact, more than just locked away, he's like, I'm going to chain you to an angry bull, and that will show you that I am the one with power here, not you, guy I don't know is actually a god. Dionysus takes it well. And by well, I mean he easily breaks free of the chains, he burns the palace to the ground, and he causes an earthquake. Kills lots of people. As you can imagine, uh, messing with a god is not particularly wise, especially not the god of madness. But uh, in any case, Dionysus basically proves immediately that, yeah, I actually am a god and I can do everything, uh, including destroy everything I want. And his first act is to immediately wander back up to Penthes, who is still losing his shit and still refuses to believe that Dionysus is a god. Because to Penthes, Dionysus is just a strange homeless man, not a divine figure, who is actually his cousin. So... Having now pissed off Dionysus, who is now essentially sitting in the throne room with a shit-eating grin, uh, finding it extremely amusing that despite the fact that Dionysus burned the palace to the ground and caused an earthquake and easily broke free of chains and a wild bull, the Pentus still refuses to believe him. So they fight a little bit more, and then a man shows up. This man is not actually important because he doesn't really have a name. He just kind of shows up. He's a herdsman, and he's come to tell the king about things he and his friends have seen. You see, he was wandering around the wilderness, as herdsmen do, herding his sheep and cattle and other stuffs, and uh, he stumbles upon the Menaeids, all of the worshippers, all of the women of Thebes, doing things that are strange. They are wandering around naked, they are sucking animals off, they are putting snakes in their hair, they're, like, performing insane miracles like causing water to spring causing trees to grow it's 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 pandemonium it's madness it's just like they're they're amazed by what they saw and they were like well we got to go and you know get closer to these crazy women who are having fun with snakes and suckling off the cows and 
all kinds of other things. Uh, there's only one problem. As soon as this guy and his friends get anywhere near them, uh, the Menades all go just completely psychotic. They go from completely peace-loving and happy to um, murderous psychopaths. And they immediately try to murder all of the men. The men, terrified, flee in, in panic. Uh, unfortunately, their animals were... Uh, were not very lucky because the women ripped the cows apart with their bare hands. So, yeah, that's a problem because now there are now it's not just oh, the women of Thebes have wandered into the wilderness. It is now now the women of Thebes all have superpowers and they will kill anyone on sight if you approach them. That's a problem. Uh except there's a bigger problem than even that, because the women don't stop. Like, they tear the cows apart, and apparently high on bloodlust, proceed to de begin sacking villages. <laughs> like, they turn into an army and just start sacking cities. Like, they steal things, all kinds of things. They steal weapons, and armor, and pottery, and babies... That's true, actually. That's, like, just deliberately listed in the story is that they wander away with people's children. Uh, because, of course, they do. Uh, the villagers, obviously, are not very happy that a bunch of naked women have shown up to steal everything. And so they're like, well, we have to fight them off. Except the women, somehow, with their bare hands, are able to fight off all of the villagers. And then after doing this, they just wander back to the mountains where all of the blood is licked off by snakes. And that's the end of that, I suppose. Now, having heard all of this, Penthes' first plan is, okay, I need an army, and I'm going to massacre all of these women. Because, obviously, the thing you want to do uh, is tell all of your soldiers to murder their wives and daughters. Because this is a great plan. As you can see, Penthes has, is, a, is a fountain of great ideas. Um... But Dionysus, being Dionysus, is like, you know, that plan of, of murdering all of the women in your city is a very bad plan and you shouldn't do it. I have a better idea. What you should do is spy on them. And Penthes is like, uh, well, I can't because they will murder any man who approaches. And Dionysus says, well, then what if you dress up like a woman and then they won't know that you're a dude and then you can spy on them. Now, this is this is a reference to rites that happened in ancient Greece. So, one of the things about the ancient world, and this transitioned later into ancient Rome, is that there were lots of rites that were only for women or only for men. And a lot of priesthoods that were only for women often had... To worry about guys dressing as women to sneak in and then have sex with the priestesses. Sometimes forcibly, which, as you can imagine, uh, never goes over well. In fact, if you're familiar with uh, uh, the story of Medusa, you'll know that this is a plot point about how Poseidon, you know, finds Medusa a priestess of Athena and then rapes her in the temple. So, this is another situation where the story is talking about something that people worried about. Men sneaking in to go see rites that they weren't supposed to. In any case, Penthes is persuaded by Dionysus to dress as a woman along with him and then go to see uh, these crazy women in the wilderness. So, they do. <laughs> they, they dress up as women, they go into the mountains, uh... And one thing that comes off in the play is that Penthes is being manipulated and is being driven insane by Dionysus. Dionysus, using his divine powers as the god of madness, is slowly driving Penthes insane. In fact, the more insane Penthes becomes, the more Dionysus' disguise wears off. Because Penthes remarks that he can see horns on Dionysus' head. As they, like, 
So basically Dionysus' true form is being revealed more and more as Pentus goes more and more insane. This is important for what's about to happen. Now, having done all of this, and having now ended up on the mountain, Dionysus and Pentus have a talk. Pentus wants to get a, a, a closer look at the Menaeids, uh, and now that he sees them, including his aunts and mother, but obviously is too terrified because he might get found out, and if he gets found out, he'll be torn apart. So he's like, okay, how do I do this? And Dionysus is like, well, the best way to do it is to climb that tree. Pentheus is like, great idea! <laughs> so Pentheus climbs the tree, and then Dionysus goes, hey, look, a spy. Uh, because Dionysus was always planning on getting his cousin brutally murdered by all of his followers the entire time, because that's how Dionysus rolls. So as you can imagine, the Menaeids having seen Penthus spying on them, fly into a rage, tear him limb from limb, and then immediately set about going back to Thebes, which is where we then cut. Somehow, a messenger shows up in Thebes uh, to tell everybody else that, oh, Penthus just got torn, or, torn apart by a bunch of naked, angry women, uh, and they are coming now back to Thebes, which as you can imagine, is very terrifying for all of the people there who are, how should we say, believers in Dionysus' power at this point, because, again, Dionysus has, in this day alone, driven all the women mad, he has caused a fire and an earthquake, and he has caused their king to be torn apart by said crazy women. Uh, none of them are particularly on board with this whole uh, ban Dionysus worship anymore because Dionysus will shank you if you try to do that. As if to make the point even more salient, the Menaeids show up in Thebes at that moment. In fact, Pentheus' mother, Agave, shows up with the severed head of her son in her hands. Because you see, Agave is one of the people who tore him apart. Now, she's insane, because she's been driven insane by Dionysus, and Dionysus has made her think that it is the head of a mountain lion, and she shows this severed head of her son to her own father, Cadmus. You remember, the, the old man who wanted to celebrate with Dionysus with his friend Tiresias. Uh, as you can imagine, uh... Cadmus is not very happy to see the severed head of his grandson, and Agave is very confused. Um, and then Agave calls out to her son to say, hey, come nail this head of a mountain lion to the door so we can show it to everybody. It is at this moment that the madness that is caused by Dionysus fades away, and Agave uh, realizes that she has torn apart and paraded the head of her own son around. Uh, which is obviously extremely horrifying to her and everybody else who participated in it. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, hold on a moment. Why is Dionysus punishing uh, his aunt? Who you might remember, you know, his aunt didn't ban worship of Dionysus. His aunt didn't, you know, didn't imprison his followers. Why is Dionysus being so cruel as to make her tear apart her own son and then parade his head around. And the answer is because she and her two other two sisters, the uh, the sisters of Samil, at the beginning of the play, you might remember, told everybody that Samil was a whore. And Dionysus has decided that because you have slandered my mother and your sister unfairly, I am going to punish you. Not nearly as bad as I punished Penthus for doing all the bad things he did, but you're still going to be punished uh, by being forced to have dismembered your own son. Uh, at which point they begin to play a game of operation to try to piece together Penthus's torn apart body as best they can because they don't have all of the pieces. They kind of lost a few as they were like wandering around with him, I guess. Um, 
So they kind of put him back together and they kind of sit around and ask, what do we do? Uh, at which point, uh, at which point they decide that the three sisters need to be sent into exile. Thebes will not be safe as long as, uh, Thebes will not be safe as long as they live here. Clearly, clearly they have displeased a god. Uh, the best thing we can do is just get rid of the entire royal family. If we just, like, exile the entire royal family and come up with a new royal family, uh, maybe things would be better and Dionysus won't keep smiting us. Uh, and then Dionysus does something very weird, at least weird from the perspective of reading the play, in my opinion, which is that he decides that Cadmus and his wife should be turned into giant snakes and lead a bunch of northern barbarians to then ravage all of Greece. Which I don't understand, because it doesn't fit with the rest of the play. I have a feeling that this is one of those moments at the end of the play where uh, Euripides is talking about something that was going on at the moment. I have a feeling that at the time this play was written, there was probably incursions from northern barbarians in the Greek view from the north, and so he's like, uh, what if I incorporate this into my play? Because you might remember that Cadmus is not a wrongdoer in this story. Cadmus, at no point, has committed any sins against Dionysus. In fact, Cadmus was 100% on board with Dionysus and was not happy with what Penthes was doing. You will remember him at the beginning being the guy that was like, hey, yeah, let's go celebrate with the uh, with all the women because Dionysus is totally like understanding what we should be doing. So it's a little weird that he gets punished by being turned into snakes. And it's even weirder that his wife gets turned into a snake because his wife doesn't appear in the play, except for this moment. Like, she just shows up. Like, she's not a character. She just shows up in the play and is like, oh, yeah, you and your... You uh, you two are going to be turned into snakes and you're going to destroy all of Greece. Why? I don't know. Uh, it's just kind of added there at the end. And that is how our tragedy ends, with everybody dead or driven insane or exiled and Dionysus standing tall because you don't go to war with a god. And that's kind of the lesson that the, the Bacchiae is trying to impart upon everyone else. Is that, you know, it's a bad idea to directly oppose a god because he will utterly crush you and depending on the god in question, uh, it might be extremely, extremely graphic in nature. Now, I will say that this kind of fits in in other stories of men crossing gods. So, some people remember the story of the Minotaur because uh, that's a story in which a man goes back on his promise with Poseidon, and Poseidon decides to, you know, get revenge on him via the, via the bull. You can also remember the Odyssey, where, you know, obviously, uh, Hera is super angry with Odysseus. Uh, you can remember Hera again in Hercules. What makes the Bacchiae different is that Dionysus is personally intervening. He is a character who makes an appearance personally. Uh, he literally shows up in the story. He's not just a force causing things. He is a character who makes physical contact with the other characters, who talks to them, who manipulates them, who acts as an individual within the context of the story. And this is obviously extremely different compared to other stories, and it will, as you can probably imagine, set the stage for future stories about gods being directly involved with things. So, that is the Bacchiae. What have we learned today? Well, you don't fight a god. Uh, we learned that Euripides really likes to write in a style that we would probably recognize today. Um, we learned that Dionysus is a god that brings you wine, which is great, uh, but he's also a god that will shank you in person if you mess with him. Uh, pretty sure that's all it, but honestly, it's a, it's, there's a reason why it's, it's such a memorable story and why it's been emulated so many times over the centuries. Uh, I will say one interesting thing about it is that 
the play itself was considered too horrific and too gruesome to be studied for most of history. Which is really funny to think. Like, people were translating it. Like, we have translations from, like, like we have early translations from, like, the medieval period. So people were translating it. But they were refusing to study it because of how, like, like, all the various scenes of people being, like, brutally dismembered. Which is kind of funny because, like, this is, like... They were still refusing to do this after Shakespeare was writing. Okay? And some of Shakespeare's plays are extremely violent and extremely gruesome. Okay? And yet, some reason, the Bacchiae was considered even worse. And you can't, you can't talk about it because it's just, it's just so, uh, just so horrific. Um, and yet... Now, in the modern age, we consider it perhaps the greatest Greek tragedy ever written. We consider it perhaps one of the greatest plays ever written, and Euripides is one of the greatest playwrights ever written. Or, I guess, say, to ever live, not ever written. Uh, honestly, honestly, it might also be one of the most translated plays ever. Because you can find free versions of it that have been translated as far back as like the eight, like the early eighteen hundreds. I think, I think there's like an eighteen twenties version that still exists somewhere in digital form. It's a, it's a play that's been translated a lot, um, and depending on whether depending on your translation, it may be in prose or it may be in verse. Because again, this was a play. Ancient Greek plays were mostly sung. Uh, which if you ever see a a rendition of any Greek play in uh, in ancient Greek, uh, what's the word? Ionic pentameter, I think it's called. It, there's a there's a specific word that I can't remember off the top of my head of of what you call it when you sing in in verse. Um, it's a trip, basically, is what I'm saying. Um, it's pretty wild. But anyway, that's been the Bacchiae. That's the story of it. That's Euripides. Uh, see you all next time.